Good morning and welcome to MAE 209. This is Probability and Statistics. My name is Richard Gore and this is Lecture 10. And in today's lecture, we're going to be doing probability distributions of discrete random variables. So I hope everyone can hear me okay in the chat. Let me just say good morning. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, perfect. And is the video coming through okay? Just checking with everyone to see if everything's flowing okay. Okay, perfect. So, probability distributions of random variable, let's, and the uh, abbreviation RV means random variable, X, says how the total probability of 1 is distributed amongst the possible values of X. Now we had seen this before in our previous lecture. So what we're going to do is, from lecture 9, we're going to look at that example of the flying bomb hits in the south of London in world during World War One. So again, like we said, we, we're going to let X be a number of bomb strikes in a grid cell. And we had this probability distribution here was X, which was the value of uh, from 0 to uh, greater than 5, greater than or equal to 5, where it goes on, the number of strikes. And so these are the number of cells that contain 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and greater than or equal to 5 strikes. And down here we have is the probability that we calculated. We're told that there was a total of 530 uh, well, there is 537 strikes in total, but we're told that we had uh, 576 grids, grids cells, and so that's all we have to do is calculate the probability for that. It's the empirical probability here. And we said that this row here, the probability associated with each value that the random variable x can take on is called the probability distribution. Now we can do some questions regarding uh, this probability distribution. So for instance, we could ask ourselves, let me just move some of these cards out of the way here. What is the probability that at most two bomb strikes occur in a grid grid? Square or grid cell. And so what that is asking us is what's the probability of x at most, so that's less than or equal to 2, so what that is saying is we want all the possible x's less than Two or equal to it, so it's the probability of x equals 0 plus the probability of x equals 1 plus the probability of x equals 2. And reading off from this, it would be 0.398 plus 0.366 plus 0.161. And hopefully everyone is doing it along with me so that we can check the here, it's a calculator, 398. And so what I get is 0 0.925.
This one asks, what is the probability that at least three bomb strikes occur in a grid cell? So this one is asking at least. So that's x is greater than or equal to three. So I can have x equals three plus x equals four plus x equals greater than or equal to five. So I could do that all, or this is also equivalent to one minus the probability of x less than three. And in this case, because we have x less than three, we have uh, one, and because we not include three, it's got to be two or less. I can use x less than or equal to two, which then equals one minus, and I can actually use the answer up here, 0 0.925. So, the answer we get for this is 0 0.075. Okay, so far? Moving on to page two. Oops. This is asking, what is the probability that between two and four bomb strikes inclusively occur in a grid cell? So inclusively means that it includes two and four. So the what they want is the probability of two less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 4. So, okay. so what we want are all the values from x equals 2, x equals 3, x equals 4, Okay, so looking at our distribution table, or our distribution, probability distribution up here, these are the values that we need. I have 0 0.161 plus 0 0.061, and lastly, point. 0, 1, 2. So, again, pull out our calculator, and so what I get is 1.61. I get 0.234. The next part of this question is asking what's the probability that strictly so this is an important key word here. Strictly between two and four bomb strikes occur in a grid cell. So we want two strictly less than x, strictly less than four. So in this case, the only values that are between 2 and 4 is just the value of x equals 3. And in this case, it's just 0 0.061. This next part, we're asked to draw the line graph of the probability function and draw the probability histogram. So, what I'll do is
I'm going to start at zero here. Let's see that this is 0 0.1. Over here is 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Zero point four, same thing. I'll just draw one over here. Okay, so what they call a line graph, so we have from zero, we'll have uh, one, two, three, four, greater than five. And so what we need to do is we need to put these values, plot these values, 0 0.398, 0 0.366, 0 0.161, 0 0.061, 0 0.012, 0 0.002. So that's what we need to plot. So what a line graph is, maybe I'll label it down here as well, just make sure that so this is what we call a line graph. is what we plot is, uh, maybe I'll use a different color so it shows up. Let's use green. And uh, I'll, we put a point around 0.398, it's around here, and we draw a line. Okay, so there's the first one. For one, we have 0.366, so that's around, let's say, around here. And I should line it up better with my horizontal axis. Then the next one that we have is point, uh, point 0.161. Sorry, we did that too. Now it's point 0 0.061. Around here. And the next one we have is 0 0.01 and lastly it's like down here okay now what they want for a histogram
or the probability histogram. So instead of using little dots and lines, they want us to use a bar. So with that, do the same thing up here. Now the bars are centered at the number that you're using. So in our case, it's zero. And there's no spaces between them. The bars are connected. finished. There we go. Okay. So there's our line graph and the probability histogram. It's still legible. I, it's, it might be that, uh, let's have a look. It's possible that the uh, resolution might have dropped for you. So if it is a bit blurry for you, just click on the little um, gear and see if you can get the resolution to go higher than say, 240 or the 360. Uh, someone's written, I thought a line graph connected the data points with a line. That would be, that graph be called. Well, this is what they are calling a line graph in the textbook. I usually, uh, I'm not sure what I usually have called this before, but this is usually what we do with, uh, with discrete random variables is because we don't want to have these points connected. There's no values that are connecting between these. So we have, because the values of the random variable from zero to one, there's nothing in between. So we just have a point and that's it. So I think the thing to be very um, aware of while it might be a line it's just trying to denote some of its um, what they call later a mass okay Okay, what's the next thing that we can do? Can we emit the bar on the histogram that goes outside of the bounds of the graph, i.e. the left part of the zero? Um, I suppose I would say you have to keep the bar in it, so I'll kind of just put a little, maybe I'll extend this. Um, you, I guess so. But I would at least draw a, 
a little bit of a, an axis to just kind of so that the bar is completely on it on the x-axis so I hope that answers that one Moving on to number three. Here's our definition. So the probability distribution or probability they say mass function which then they abbreviate as PMF of a discrete random variable and they is defined for every number x by so in this book in the textbook that we're using I'm just looking at, there's a question. Someone wrote, is there a higher chance of each grid cell getting hit than not getting hit? Would this be expressed as the probability of x equals 0 less than the probability of x greater than 0? So that's a good question. And we'll get back to that. I'll just finish writing this out. So we're just defining what a probability distribution is. So it's every number. So it's all the sample points in S such that x in that sample point is equal to x. So there are some conditions that means we need to have for this probability mass function. That is the probability of the each value x for the random variable has to be greater than or equal to 0 for all x and the second one is that the sum of all the values of x or should I say, the sum of all the values, all the, hmm, <laughs> it's the sum of all the values x, it's that the random variable can take, and then we have the probability. So the probability of each value that the random variable can take on has to sum up to give you 1. Or in other words, the probabilities
my sum to 1. Again, because we're using our definition, the idea is that we have a total probability of 1, and we're going to distribute that amongst all the values of x. So it has to sum up to 1. So what I'll do is we'll temporarily just pause for a second. I keep knocking the microphone. So if I continue this example, we're on part G now. So going back to our distribution, to check if the probability distribution conditions are satisfied. So for 1, yes, each value of x, the probability of x is greater than or equal to zero, so we can see each value that it takes on. It's well, it's all positive, so that's good. In the second part, we just need to check so that again we just take this and we sum it all up. So, point three nine eight plus 0.366 plus 0.161 plus so all these values so here's our calculator and turn it on 0 0.398 0 0.366 0 0.01 0 0.161 0 0.061 And so we see that, yes, it does add up to 1. So here's a good question that came from the audience. So overall, is there a higher probability of each grid cell getting hit than not getting hit? And he's already translated this for us, which is quite nice, into mathematical notation. So he says, is the probability of x equals 0 less than the probability of x greater than 0? Well, on this side here, we know that it's 0 0.0, 0 0.398, 
over on this side. Well, to calculate that, I would just take 1 minus 0.398. So Eric, who asked this in the question, What's your answer then? That's right, yes. So that is your answer. It's quite likely that a grid square got hit. So now what we'll do is we'll talk about a parameter of a probability distribution. Okay, so we have a parameter of a probability distribution. So what I'll say is, let's consider a coin flip. Then we know that the sample space must be heads or tails. We can let x equal, we'll say 1 or 0. So we're defining our random variable. If the coin is heads, And over here, we'll say if the coin is tails. Now, what kind of random variable is this, where the values that the random variable can take is either 0 or 1? Just asking in the chat there, what kind is it? We, I think we had done it in the previous lecture. It was named after a mathematician. Yes, it is Bernoulli. Yep. Bernoulli is the one. Sorry, I'm just refilling my pen. <clears throat> yep. James Bernoulli. And that was uh, also a relative to the other Bernoulli who came up with the Bernoulli principle, the whole family, there was a whole string of mathematicians that came out of that family, so yes. So this is a Bernoulli. This is a Bernoulli. 
random variable. Okay, so we have zero, 01. Now what I'm going to say is, now suppose that the probability of the coin Landing on heads, heads. So the probability, instead of saying one half or three quarters or whatever, let's just say we'll call that alpha. So what is the probability of the coin landing on tails then in the chat? One minus alpha, yep. Good. And that's by the complement rule. And again, the reason for that is the probability distribution has to sum up to give you one. So you'll have one plus one minus alpha, that sums up to one then. So we can write our probability distribution like this. So you could express it as a table. You could express it as this um, equation that involves a case. This is what I mean by cases because we're breaking it down case by case. One minus alpha if x equals zero and zero otherwise. Now, what I want to just make a little note, because in the book they, they do start to specify zero otherwise, but it's common, it's common practice, at least in probability theory, it's common to define the probability mass function only for values of x such that uh, for values where the random variable's probability is greater than zero. So the particular value of alpha could change for a different coin. So what would be nice is to be able to express it as the input of the probability mass function, the parameter alpha. So what we'll do is To include the parameter alpha. So what they would say is we'll use p x, they use a semicolon, and then alpha.
So if you were trying to calculate then the probability mass function for a particular value of x, you need also that value of alpha. So again, we'll just kind of copy out the above. And zero otherwise. So changing the parameter alpha will yield yields a different probability mass function. And the collection of all those probability dense, uh, distribution for different values of the values of the parameter is called a family Again, because they're all related. They have the same form. OK, so let me just show you what I mean. So for example, if I used px semicolon 1 half, well in this case, that's my alpha. So it would be alpha, so that's 1 half if x is equal to 1. And over here, so again, that's just alpha. Over here, that would be alpha. That should be 1 minus alpha. So a half, so 1 minus a half is equal to 1 half. If x equals 0. So here I'm just going to draw my a graph of it. So I get a half and a half here. Same thing over here. And I'll label this as one half over here. So that's one distribution. 
We could also have where the coin is landing on heads three quarters of the time. So it lands on heads three quarters, which means by the complement rule it should land on tails one quarter. So again, drawing my what they call a line graph. So same thing, I can, for x equals 0, it's a quarter. And for 1, it's 3 quarters. So again, this is where the alpha is 1 half. And this is where the alpha is 3 quarters. And so these two probability distributions are part of a family of probability distributions. There's one more related term. And that is the cumulative distribution function. So here we go. The so this is a definition. So we have the cumulative distribution function or the CDF and they use big F of X is the oh sorry of the of a discrete random variable let me say x and they this random variable will have a a probability mass function P of x defined for every number x by, so they use a big capital F. And so what they mean by the idea of cumulative, it's all the probabilities up to a certain point. So it's the probability of the random variable x less than or equal to the value x. So some particular value of x. Or you can think of it as we're going to sum Uh, why I'm switching to uh, y is because I need a dummy variable. 
So I have y. So I had all the values of y such that y is less than x. Less than or equal to. Hopefully that's clear enough. So in words, what that actually means, it's for every x, f at x is the probability that the observed value of the random variable x will be at most x. Oh, somebody's asking me about what happened to zero or otherwise. So, for me, I'm just going to point out, it's common to define the PMF only for values of x such that the probability is greater than zero. So if we don't specify a particular value, uh, the probability at a particular value, we'll assume that it's zero. So we don't have to always keep explicitly writing zero otherwise. In the book, they may be a little bit more... Uh, they may write this explicitly all the time, but it's almost convention that we don't um, write down zero for values. Okay. So, uh, and yes, to answer the question also, it says it's up to and including x. Yes, so it's up to and including x. So there's the CDF. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just For that very simple of, uh, let's use the coin, and the coin has a probability mass function. We'll use one half. It's one. Now that, that equals zero. <laughs> okay. 
so the probability of or sorry for the for the CD uh, CDF or the cumulative distribution function we're going to calculate F at 0 so that's the probability that X is less than or equal to 0 and in this case that's just the probability of X equals 0 or maybe I should in here this would be 0 with 1 half so that would be 1 or 0.5 Okay, and then for the cumulative dense or the cumulative distribution function at one, that would be all the values of x less than or equal to one. So that's going to include x equals zero plus x equals one. And so we can also then draw a probability, or sorry, a line graph for the CDF as well. There we go. So it's the this is the CDF then. So we'll be going from 0 and we have 1. I can't tell if we're using capital X or a lowercase. Okay. What I usually try to do is um, for my capital X's I just use like that and for a lowercase what I usually try to do is something like that where the X is kind of curled but as long as you have some way to denote you know your capital letters from your little letters that should be fine so right here is this is a capital X less than or equal to a little x. Now doing our line graph, we're going to go up to, and I should have labeled my, so we'll say this is 0 0.5. So less than this point, maybe I won't use that because I need to also get up to um, one, two, three. Say this is one up here. So up until that point, it's zero. As soon as it gets to zero, it jumps up. And it will stay 0.5.
until it hits 1, at which point it then jumps up to 1. So again, just making note, very similar to what we did in calculus in 101, we have an open circle, so we going up to that point but not including it, then the actual value would be 0.5, it continues on to the value x equals 1, it doesn't include it, it jumps up again, and then it goes on forever. Oops, okay, so let's do this one. Moving on to seven, page seven. Let's go back to that example. You don't have to keep copying that over and over again. This is just for convenience so uh, that everyone can see what I'm doing. Oh, can we take a break? What I'll say is, let me finish this, and then uh... okay. No, let's take a break then for ten minutes. So from nine oh five, and then we'll return at nine fifteen.
Okay, so we're going to resume, sorry, resume our class. Now that we have a 10 minute break, hopefully you have another cup of coffee ready. So we're gonna resume this example here, which is the bombs in London during World War II. Given that we have this uh, probability mass function, we are asked to calculate and graph the cumulative density function, or CDF. So the problem that we have to also deal with is this greater than five. Now, the way that we can do this is we were told initially that there was 537 strikes in total. So so what we had was, well we won't count the zero because there was uh, those are zeros that's 229 grid cells are where there's zero hits but you just want the ones where there are hits or strikes so we have one two three four so we had uh, 211 uh, we also have 93 35 and 7 and so what we need to do is multiply these. So we have 211. 93 times 2 is 186. There's 35, 35, and 35 is 105. And 7 times 4 is 28. So adding that all up, We have 530 strikes, which means we have 537 in total. There should be seven. So we know that one grid square must be greater than or equal to five. And well, there are seven strikes. If I assign five, that means that I would have two left over and those two would have to be included in that grid square. So it can't be five, it can't be six, because again, if I have six in that one grid square, then I would have another square where there's one and that's not possible. So it must be that there's seven in here. Does that make sense to the people in the chat? So there's only one grid square. With seven strikes. Okay, so now that we have that, Sir, can you re-explain again why there are seven strikes? Well, there was, from the initial equation, or from the question, from the data, we were told that there was 537 strikes in total. What I then did is, these are the grid squares that have strikes. So I can actually count up the number of, of bomb hits. So here's one, uh, the total squares that have one hit 
is 211, so there's 211 strikes right there. There's 93 grid squares that have two hits, so, so 93 times 2 gives me 187 strikes there. Same thing for here, there was 35 grid squares that had three hits, so 35 times three gives you 105. And lastly, there's seven squares that have four hits. There's 28. So when I sum those up, I've accounted in this section here, 530 strikes. But I know that there is 537 in total, so I subtract what I've got here I've accounted for, so that means that the greater than 5, there's 7 strikes left over for this, this one right here. Now again, it has to be greater than 5, and there's only one square. So you have to assign that 7 strikes to this, this one cell. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So now we can start to calculate the CDF, because now that we have figured out that the greater than 5 is really 7, we'll calculate the value, the cumulative uh, distribution function at 0, so that's where the probability is x less than or equal to 0, and so that just works out to just being the probability of x equaling 0, and so that is point, just reading from here, 0.398. For f1, this is the probability that x is less than or equal to 1, which means that I have probability of x equals 0 plus the probability of x equals 1. Grab a calculator. Oh, I really... So it's 0.398 plus 0.366, oops, 98. So adding those together, 0.764. Now we can do two, that's all the probabilities of x less than 2. So that would be the probability of x equals 0 plus the probability of x equals 1 plus the probability that x equals 2. So you can write that out. And in this case, it's 0.161. Now I already still have that entered in my calculator. So there's the two entries right there. Plus the 161 gives me 0 0.925. The probability of less than or equal to 3. So I'm just going to sum those all up. So again, it's 0.398 plus 0.966 plus 0.966 plus 
point three nine eight plus point three six six plus point one six one plus the new value here, which is point zero one two. So adding that in, I get point nine three seven. Oh, did I make a mistake? Zero, one, two. Oh, thank you. So I need to have it for three. So zero, one, two, three. So let's do that calculation again. Point nine two five plus point zero one should be zero point nine eight six. So up to here, I'll just do 0.986. So that's up to three, plus I need the fourth one, which is 0 0.012. And lastly, we have seven. Something over all of them, all the x's less than or equal to 7. Because again, we don't have consecutive integers. Point 0.998 plus, we have our last one up here, which is point zero zero 0.002. And so that equals one. So then the CDF is So we have from zero, so this is for x less than zero. We have 0.398, so up here. This is where it's between zero and one. So zero less than or equal to x, strictly less than one. Point seven six four, and this is between one and x less than two, and so all I'm doing is I'm just using these values.
0.998 for 4 less than or equal to x up to 7 and then it's 1 for x greater than or equal to 7. And that's our CDF. So we can quickly draw a graph of the CDF. So hopefully I got enough lines. Okay, so I'm trying to keep, let's see if I can try to keep as much, oh, there we go. I just need my grid points though first before I start moving this. So I have one uh, what would you use this for this is a good question uh, we use it more in the continuous random variables, the CDF. And the reason for that is because when we get to continuous random variables, remember that uh, the probability of a point is zero. We can't actually do a probability of a point on continuous. So we have to always use some sort of length. Um, but that's basically it. Is it, we use a lot of the CDF in in continuous random variables. So we're giving basically the same definition, showing that it can also work for a discrete random variable. Okay. I hope that answers some of it, but uh, it also is a different way of viewing how the probabilities are distributed. Yep, that is a very good question. I feel like the notation for saying, for example, x is greater than or equal to 1 but less than 2 doesn't make sense. Wouldn't it be simpler to say when x is equal to 1 
since there is no number in between. Yes, I would say to that is very simple, like it's very similar to interpolation. So we're interpolating what the values would be in between it. If that helps. I Like I said, I feel like the CDF is much more useful when we get to uh, continuous random variables. Three. I wish I could give a better answer, but or something that's a little bit more satisfying, but it's basically because we do this so much in continuous random variables. So we have 0.3 up to about here, so. Here's one, two, three, four. And also you can see a kind of the accumulation of the probability as we go through here. So for instance, when we're looking at this in the context of the bomb strikes, you know, the prob what's the probability that you would have one strike? Well, it's 0.398. If you wanted to know what the probability was between for one Let's see, we go up to six, seven. You know, about up to one, we'd expect there's at least points, like a 76% chance of having it. If you wanted to say, um, you know, two or more, or sorry, two or less, so again, it's just a different way. Sometimes people want to know what the accumulation is. Three. So we have 0.92. It's jumping again. Then we're getting really, really close. Four, even closer. Right up to seven. That's it. Now what we can also do is we can also go the other way. From the CDF, we can also generate the probability mass function. So in the bomb example, again, if we used wanted to calculate 3, which is the probability of x equals 3. 
well, it would be the probability of x less than 3 minus the probability of x less than 2. Or you could think of that as f at 3 minus f at 2, which we had calculated that as from 3 from the 3 right here, which was 0 0.986 minus the 2, 0.925, which gives us 0 0.061, which is the same value that we have for 3. Somebody's asked, why did it go up at 5? Uh, not, I don't think it did go up at 5. We had it at 4. And then at 5, it's still the same. So in the, I, I think if that's what you mean by the graph... And the next thing is, we can look at the, say, the probability of 2 less than x. So you could repeat this for each you know, p0, p1, p2. Well, I don't know. It's good that people are checking because I might not have. I might have. Because I'm writing this at an angle that it could have possibly not lined up at four. So let's do the probabilities of less than, let's see, four. Well, again, if we're going to just use the CDF to calculate this, it's the probability of x less than 4. And we need to subtract the probability of x less than 2. And the reason why we're using strictly less than 2 is because What we need to do is we're calculating all this probability up to this point up to here. Right? So we're going we're sweeping up to this point so we get that probability which is uh, let me write that from the paper that we had. We had 0.998. And we need to have it up to and including two. So if we go up to here. Uh, if we using the probability density, or sorry, the, the the cumulative density, I can't use f at uh, f at two. I have to use one less than that. So. I can use x less than or equal to 1. So if I go back and look at that, it's 0.764. And if I calculate that, oops, 0 0.998, 0 0.764, subtracting that, we get 0 
Now, if you don't believe me why I did all this, again, because I had to exclude the, you know, subtracting not uh, x less than 2, the strictly less than 2. If you don't believe me, we can, we've already done it in the previous on page 2. So we had calculated that using the, the PMF. So it was for the probability of 2 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 4, it is in fact 0.32 sorry, 0.234. So, just as kind of like a summary for this part right here, any two numbers a and b where a is less than b or less than or equal to b the probability of a less than x less than b is equal to So this we had actually calculated was 4 and subtracted over here was probability f at 1. So it's, in this case, we see that it's b minus f at a minus, where the a minus is the largest x such that x is less than a. Okay, that's all the time that we have for today's lecture. Is there any questions before we finish for today? So again, we had gone over So as for questions about that, okay, so So the midterm we have to cover up to I believe it's section 3.3 3. so we have to still cover the expected values Uh, and the variance, standard deviation, so we'll have some practice questions, we'll post some of those later today.
don't have any previous midterms that you can use for practice, but uh, the questions will be similar to the assigned questions. Uh, examples from lectures. And the quiz. Is there anything up to 3.3 that won't be covered? Uh, nope. Because 3.3 will cover the expected values, the variance, and the standard deviation. What will be the format of the midterm? Uh, as, as for the format, very similar to it'll be over, uh, you know, some torp some type of Zoom call and uh, submitted solutions through Moodle. Okay. And again, more details to come. On Moodle. OK, so I hope it'll be very similar, I think, to the, what we did with the quiz, except it's going to be a little bit longer. It'll be one, uh, I won't say how long it will be yet. I think it's it's supposed to be one period, but I'll have to double check what we had put in the course syllabus. Is there any other questions? Okay. If there's any more, send me an email. Okay, everyone, take care and have a great rest of the day.